We hear a lot about pharmacy benefit managers or PBMs. Some healthcare purchasers and payers say PBMs reduce or hold the line on healthcare costs and prescription drug costs in particular. Others say PBMs reduce people's access to medications they need. Insurers and pharmaceutical companies blame each other for high prescription drug costs. Multiple House and Senate committees are holding hearings on PBMs. The Federal Trade Commission is studying how PBMs affect people's access to medications. Many patients and clinicians wonder who's right and what, if anything, they should advocate for. This value and innovation forum briefing will answer some of those questions. The experts on today's panel bring a variety of viewpoints and insights. I expect that at the end of this hour, you will have greater clarity about issues related to PBMs and be better equipped to advocate with policymakers. I'm John Clymer, Executive Director of the National Forum for Heart Disease and Stroke Prevention and Co-Chair of the Value and Innovation Forum with Alan Balch of the Patient Advocate Foundation. We are pleased to welcome you to this briefing and we thank Amgen whose sponsorship makes it possible. The topic and speakers were chosen by a steering committee that includes Dr. Don L. Ivey of the Association of Black Cardiologists and Michael Bagel of the Alliance of Community Health Plans, in addition to Dr. Balch and me. To lead today's briefing and help our speakers cut through the rhetoric and deliver facts and insights, I am pleased to introduce the moderator, Julie Balter. Ms. Balter is the manager of the Clinical Innovations Program at the Alliance of Community Health Plans. Ms. Balter. Thank you so much, John. Hi, everyone. As John mentioned, my name is Julie Balter, and I'm a member of the Clinical Innovations Team at the Alliance of Community Health Plans. In my role, I oversee our pharmacy directors community and drug pricing work, and I have been deep, deep into the topic of today's webinar. I wanted to share a little bit about who ACHP is and our perspective on pharmacy benefit managers before turning it over to our expert panelists today. ACHP is the only national organization promoting the unique payer-provider alliance model in healthcare. ACHP member companies collaborate with their provider partners to deliver high-quality coverage and care to tens of millions of Americans across nearly 40 states and the District of Columbia. ACHP was the only national payer organization who supported robust drug pricing reform. In August of 2021, ACHP came out with a set of robust policy positions to lower the cost of drugs through competition and transparency. We still strongly believe in those core principles as we move forward conversations about what comes next. When talking to our members about pharmacy benefit managers and PBMs, we found that they really use three different models. One is that they take on the PBM functions themselves, and we'll have a conversation about what some of those functions are and where they add value to the system. The next is that they utilize one of the larger PBMs, and certainly we'll have a lot of conversation about the consolidation around PBMs and what the large PBMs are doing within the market. And the third and final is that they own or operate their own PBM many of them using a model we strongly believe in, which is transparent and fee-based. I'm sure we'll have a lot of conversation about transparency today as well. We believe in the value and functions of the PBMs, especially in supporting clinical care and access to medications. We believe that transparency is needed to provide the information to make the best decisions, and that that information is needed before reforms can go into place. Our three transparency recommendations are to require PBMs to report monetary amounts paid either directly or indirectly in rebates, fees, or other compensation to brokers and consultants, bringing a new piece of the puzzle to the table, subjecting PBM subsidiaries, affiliates, or subcontractors, including group purchasing organizations and rebate aggregators to transparency requirements in the same manner as the PBMs themselves, looking from top to bottom, and last, requiring PBMs to disclose the acquisition cost of drugs and any additional dollars received via the PBM structures. These are just three ideas in which reporting and transparency can help us think about where we go next. And I'm sure we'll have a robust discussion about that today. We have a great panel of experts here to share their expertise. We have Jim Ballinger, who's principal at Ballinger RX Consulting. 
Kristen Bass, who is the Chief Policy and External Affairs Officer at the Pharmaceutical Care Management Association. Barack Richman, who is the Catherine T. Bartlett Professor of Law and Professor of Business Administration at Duke University. And Michael Baxter, who is currently serving as the Acting Head of Government Affairs for the American Pharmacists Association. Truly a well-rounded panel of perspectives. After we hear from each of them, we will have a lively discussion of the remaining issues and questions that the panelists feel are important for the audience to know, especially in your advocacy work. You can use the chat feature to share your thoughts and reactions with other attendees, but we do ask that you utilize the Q&A feature to pose questions so that I can pose them to the appropriate panelists for a response. Audience members can upvote questions that they seem particularly interested in, and those questions will rise to the top and help ensure that they catch my attention. The chat will move quickly, so we prefer that you put the questions in the Q&A so they remain visible. Now I'll turn it over to Jim. Hi, everyone, uh, and welcome. Um, my background, just to provide clarity, I've been in managed, uh, managed healthcare pharmacy management for 35 years, which is seems a little hard to believe, but um, I have worked in uh, multiple PBMs as well as health plans. Uh, and in my most recent job, I was the uh, chief pharmacy officer for a regional PBM uh, that served uh, commercial clientele, a lot of them self-funded. So I've seen about everything. Uh, when I started in retail pharmacy after I got out of school, um, we were still filling out claim forms by hand and you would send them in. You had no idea, you know, whether they were going to get paid, whether the drugs were covered. You were so often guessing at, you know, reimbursement rates and so on and so forth. And it's gotten very complex since then. I mean, we've gone from uh, submitting paper claims to, um, you know, doing online real-time claims processing and you know now we're starting to see even further development i mean online eligibility online uh announcement of coverage uh prior authorizations being managed online um and so on and the slide that's up on the um screen basically talks about all the elements that went into this i think this is a cbo yeah congressional budget office slide uh, that I think dates back a few years, so it's probably even more sophisticated now. But you know, if you follow the arrows, arrows you see uh, all the players at that point in time, and you're looking at a flow of funds, you're looking at flow of drugs, you're looking at services, and all the give and take between all the people who are involved. So it's not a simple process. Um, and lately, uh, one of the things in my state that uh, politicians like to say is uh, at, every, at some point everybody has to take a turn in the barrel and right now the PBMs are taking a turn in the barrel everybody is looking at this you know uh, Julie mentioned some um, you know some uh, hearings that are going on I think John brought that up as well uh, everybody's focusing on the business model for PBMs so the timing for this presentation uh, and discussion is very good um and uh, i'll stop there and uh, look forward to answering some of the questions so back to you Keila. thank you so much we'll turn it over to barack for his comments next uh so thanks julie um i'll also begin with an introduction uh i'm an economist and a lawyer um, and I come through the health, I come to the health sector mostly through the lens uh, of antitrust and competition law. So when there is any kind of significant consolidation uh, in the industry, uh, if there's any kind of regulatory framework that impedes competition, that's where my worries start to go up. Um, and I, I think that that's a good time for anyone worry, anyone's worries to go up. Um, whether you're talking about the hospital market or the insurance market or the physician market or the pharmaceutical market, uh, when there is monopoly power, prices do go up, quality tends to go down, service tends to go down, innovation tends to go down, um, and consumers and patients uh, are the ones who suffer. So 
when I come to the pharmaceutical market, the first place I begin is with that very complicated chart that Jim uh, uh, shared with you. In many ways, actually, that is probably, it could be the most important and most useful thing that you'll see today. Um, one of the most important questions regarding PBMs are, what are PBMs? And I think that the basic answer is that PBMs are intermediaries. They stand somewhere between the patient and the pharmaceutical manufacturer. Um, but there are other intermediaries too. Um, these are intermediaries. Uh, there are intermediaries. PBMs serve as intermediaries between uh, patients um, uh, and their insurance product. They are also intermediaries between the insurer and the manufacturers. And what we have is a very complicated distribution system where PBMs are, in many ways, a gateway for the pharmaceutical benefit. They help determine um, not only what drugs you have access to, but also what prices you pay. So um, if we understand uh, PBMs as intermediaries, and then we also understand the very significant development over the last 15 years that there's been a lot of consolidation within the inter within the PBM space. Now, the basic numbers are that there are three dominant PBMs. Those three together amount to somewhere between 80 and 85% of all filled pharmaceuticals. Um, so you have a fairly concentrated industry uh, and these serve collectively as I think some kind of bottleneck inside this gateway, inside this, this um, distribution chain. And from my perspective, from an antitrust perspective, I ask the question, well, what do these intermediaries do? What value do they create? What bottlenecks or market power do they exercise? And how bad is it that there are only three of them that dominate the marketplace? So much like most economists views on most things, there are two hands. On one hand, um, they uh, these large intermediaries do bring new innovations. They bring new services. Um, mail order, uh, as Jim mentioned, is much more common now. Um, there are several new interfaces that make it much easier for individuals to obtain drugs. Perhaps more importantly, um, the PBMs also serve as some kind of counterweight to uh, monopoly power exercised by pharmaceutical companies. PBMs create formularies. And what formularies basically are, if there are two drugs that could serve a certain um, medical class, the PBMs effectively can create a framework that decide which of those two drugs uh, are available to you. And they can facilitate price competition. Drug company A and drug company B can compete with each other by lowering prices um, and uh, in, or, in exchange for getting a better spot on a PPM's formulary. That's the way it's supposed to work. And sometimes that is the way it works. Uh, sometimes it's very good to have an intermediary that has some kind of market power that ostensibly can drive down producer prices. And again, ostensibly pass on some of those reduced prices to you, to me. Um, but it's not entirely clear that that's what PBMs actually do. Um, for one, they do enjoy significant market power on their own, which means that they do increase prices for certain services. That also means they don't assuredly pass down all of the savings to health plans and to consumers and to patients. They also have a, a, introduce a very significant danger of colluding, not, not in a back office sort of way, um, but collaborating in an anti-competitive way with manufacturers. A drug manufacturer might say, look, if, um, in, in or if you give my one drug a really good spot on your formulary, I will give you a better price on this other drug. And this other drug could be something that um, has a patent that is has no substitute that allows the drug company to exercise market power. And to put it in lay terms, the PBM as an intermediary might not be working for you and me and patients. They might instead be working for 
the pharmaceutical companies and expanding and magnifying their market power. Um, the short of it is we don't really know what they do. Um, the third element, in addition to being uh, an intermediary and in addition to having some market power, the third element of PBMs is that they're very secretive. There's very little data that we have. I think that's one reason why so many people ask for transparency. Now, I'm not sure transparency will necessarily on its own really make the market work better. It might. Um, but it does mean, the lack of transparency does mean that we really don't know uh, what PBMs are actually doing to end prices. We know that there are lots of rebates given to health plans and, and individuals. We know that there are a lot of uh, discounts that are given um, and rebates given to pharmaceutical companies. We know there's an extraordinary amount of cash that are flowed across PBMs, but we don't really know what role they play in the marketplace. Do they create efficiencies? Do they bring prices down? Do they facilitate innovation? Or do they ossify innovation? Do they expand market power? Um, and are they hurting rivals? Um, I would surmise that there's a significant amount of both going on. Um, I don't think the PBMs are boogie people who deserve to be vilified categorically. At the same time, I think they present some very significant competition problems that might benefit from some regulatory interventions, that might benefit from some antitrust suits, um, but that certainly would benefit from some more study. Um, these are very large entities in a very significant value chain uh, and we don't really know what they do. Um, so with that, uh, I'm enthusiastic that the, that the FTC is pursuing a, an investigation. I am enthusiastic about webinars like this that start to parse and explain and scrutinize what PBMs do. And I'm enthusiastic uh, and very encouraging of more conversations here on. Thank you so much, Barack. And that segues nicely into our next panelist, who I think can start to answer some of the questions you posed. So Kristen, would you like to go next? Sure. Uh, John, do you want to pull my slides up, please? So um, I work for PCMA, which is the trade association for the pharmacy benefit companies. And uh, ours, and so we represent the industry. And you can go to the next slide. It, it should be made very clear up front. Nobody is required to hire a pharmacy benefit company. You can very easily, as Julie says, um, try to, to approach the scale and do all these negotiations yourself and figure out how you're going to get drugs um, the eligibility checked at the pharmacy counter and the negotiation done with the pharmacy and all the rest of it, if you want to, virtually every plan sponsor has decided that it is way more efficient to hire somebody else to do this job and therefore they hire a PBM. And plan sponsors include your employer, if you're in a union, your union, uh, if you are Medicare eligible, Medicare plans, if you are in Medicaid, um, either the state or um, a Medicaid uh, PBN that's been hired to do Medicaid, um, churches, all kinds of plan sponsors and insurers obviously use PBMs. Um, Barack just talked about there are three major PBMs, which is true, but there are 73 full service PBMs vying for business in this country. And in fact, over the last two years, the number of PBMs increased. There are six new ones. And so there, there is market dynamic and market changes, and there is actually fierce competition among PBMs for the business of people who are sponsoring health insurance. Next slide, please. So why would somebody hire a PBM? As I noted, one of the, the major things that PBMs do is when you go to the pharmacy to get your drug, your prescription filled, you hand over the script or it's been e-prescribed preferably, and somebody has check the system to see, are you eligible? Do you have insurance? What's your cost sharing? Is this drug in your formulary? All of that is done via software that the, the PBM supplies. And so the PBM is, is what is responsible for sort of instantaneously, if you will, adjudicating your claim, your, your prescription, and that isn't done anywhere else in the health system. Everywhere else you go to the doctor and you know you get an explanation of benefits some number of days later. With the PBM, it's done right away. Um, PBMs also negotiate lower costs for brand drugs and generic drugs, which helps with getting drugs to patients more affordably. 
Um, PPMs also have the software to do the drug-drug interactions. And well, your pharmacy should be able to do this as well. If you're going to multiple pharmacies, then the PBM can look at what's going on and, and can really spot if there's a given drug that maybe has an interaction and, and alert the pharmacy that that's happening. PBMs run adherence programs to try and encourage people to stay on their drugs. And so PBMs are helping drive better outcomes that way. And then there are PBM tools that, that, that do more to deliver savings. And I'm sure those of you who've run into a prior authorization or have step therapy required to sometimes um, bristle at that intervention, but it is really helping to keep costs down for everybody. If in fact, rather than go to the brand drug that the brand manufacturer would love you to start on, you start with a generic to see if maybe that works and then figure out what's the next step after that. Next slide. So how do PBMs enable patient access? There are a whole variety of things we, that our companies do, and I'll not read through the entire list on the left since all of you have eyes, I hope, and those of you who don't, um, we'll probably talk about many of these as we, don't, as we go through this. Um, but I'll cover a couple of these things, and just to reinforce, our companies do stand between patients and drug companies. If a, a brand drug manufacturer has the equivalent of a monopoly pricing capability, and you went in, and your doc prescribed this for you and you went to get it filled, you would be paying list price. With a PBM, the PBM can figure out through its, its clin clinical experts, which advise it on what needs to be on its formulary, are there competitors for that brand drug? And if there are competitors, then the PBM is in the position of going to those various competitors to get them to negotiate and, and bring down the price. And they do that through what's called a rebate, which is an after the fact payment that PBM has, has to prove that it, it delivered a certain number of um, prescriptions to get a rebate. And that system was not created by PBMs, that was created by the drug manufacturers. So that's really important. And then PBMs also negotiate with pharmacies to set up pharmacy networks and to try and get the best price that they can out of the pharmacies. And we all know that there are a ton of pharmacies in this country. Um, the big box stores have them, grocery stores have them. There are independent pharmacists who are incredibly important in many communities. And we have, we and NCPA, which represents the independent pharmacies, have found that that, that is a stable uh, market at this point, that, that um, the independent pharmacies have increased very, very modestly, but that's really stable over time. So our companies do a whole lot to, to try and make sure that people have access to prescription drugs. And I'm sure we'll get into transparency in a little bit, but our companies absolutely agree that transparency is important and that transparency that people can act on is, is especially important. And that includes giving people tools and doctors tools so that they can tell right at the point of prescribing what the patient's cost sharing is gonna be and what's on the formulary. And with that, I'll stop. And I'm sure that, um, that we'll, Julie um, will get to uh, others and, and to additional questions. Obviously, um, Michael Baxter needs to go next. Thank you so much, Chris. And yes, let's turn it over to Michael. Sure, can you hear me? That's great. Oh, Loud well, and clear. Okay, great. So. Well, thanks for having me. I'm Michael Baxter. Um, I'm the acting head of government affairs for the American Pharmacists Association. That represents our nation's 300,000 plus pharmacists. That's pharmacists at all sites, including all sites of care, including also managed care pharmacists and pharmacists who do work for pharmacy benefit managers as well, too. So we're, we're very proud of all the work that our pharmacists do across the supply chain. I think, you know, obviously, we're also concerned about the impact of PBM uh, practices, I think, on independent and small and community pharmacists. So to start out with, with a one-on-one, -on -one, we just did one on Capitol Hill, actually, recently on this topic. And to start out with, I, I used to have a slide that said, you know, we regret to inform you that the prices are fake uh, because the prices that are out there right now, they're called list prices, are not the real prices. They're not the prices that the plan pays. They're not the price that you pay at the counter. Uh, they're the starting point. They're a negotiation process. So that price is actually um, hidden. Uh, so a lot of folks can't see it. It's actually proprietary a lot of the time. So it's set by these private deals which really creates an inefficient marketplace because there's not a lot of transparency. Uh, it was mentioned before that a lot of those reductions, quote, and quote, unquote, on, in savings come from rebates um, is what they're called right now. And there's a lot of question on whether rebates are playing a good or a negative role right now. Um, but what that all does is creates kind of a situation that's prone to manipulation. And it kind of gets us to where 
where we got to today. So it's really kind of tried as well to your drug prices uh, that you pay at the counter. So next slide. So PBMs were meant to be a force for good. They really were. Uh, they were started in the 60s as a cost savings measure by managing uh, drug benefits for health insurers. Uh, more recently, and it was mentioned, I think, too, Kristen mentioned, they've changed their names to pharmacy benefit corporations. So it's a little rebranding. We all appreciate that. Um, but the business practices are what we're really focused on. Uh, common services, they provide formulary management, uh, negotiating rebates and discounts for drug manufacturers has been discussed, uh, claim adjudication, um, and they're a subcontractor of the health insurance company. Uh, decades ago, as more medicines entered the marketplace and prescription drug costs grew, uh, health plans sought ways to hold spending accountable through benefits design. Uh, PBMs were brought in as an act as friction against the drug makers, wholesalers, pharmacies, and other members of the drug supply chain. Uh, some see PBMs only as claims processors, uh, but they've taken on a much more active role in determining what drugs your health plan covers and what you pay for those drugs. And as the PBMs, as you can see on this slide, work to control one end of the drug supply chain, uh, they began to develop business interests in the very marketplace that they were hired to control. Uh, today, PBMs advertise that they are the only entity working to control prescription drug costs, but data shows that PBM profits generated off prescription drug transactions heavily distorts these incentives uh, to control drug pricing for their clients. Next slide. So you can see here the problem, vertical integration that was mentioned before, and I think Barack mentioned that as well, too. So this is a little visual. It's from Jug Channel. It's very popular, too, as well. You can see it. Um, on Twitter or online, if you look for it really easily. Well, this kind of breaks it all down. It also includes a new player in there, the government purchasing organizations that are being utilized by PBMs. Um, a lot of them are based offshore that the FTC is also looking into them too, as well as the study it was mentioned earlier on. Um, but we want to give everybody a visual of what it looks like out in the marketplace. So you can see on the next slide, and I believe the question was asked, so who are the top three? You can see right there the top three um, that are listed, Caremark, OptumRx, and Express Scripts. So a little visual to help people understand uh, how big the marketplace is for the big three. Next slide. Um, so what we do, obviously, for our members and our pharmacists is we put out a survey um, about all the business practices that are going on that they're impacted on um, and how that affects their practice and how it affects patient care. Um, you can see recently that that result of that survey, 91.5% of our respondents that came back from 547 respondents said that these business practices have negatively affected their practice and the ability to provide patient care. Uh, what are those practices that have impacted them? I think Brock mentioned some of these patient steering is one of them. So steering patients to only use um, a pharmacy that's actually owned by the same company um, that may own your insurance company as well. Uh, clawback fees, these are often called DIR fees, a direct and indirect remuneration in Medicare Part D. Um, and this is where, for instance, if you dispense a medication at the counter for $5 and then six months or a year later, you owe 10 to $20. That's not a business sustainable model. Uh, we can't continue that going forward. So that certainly hurts a lot of our members too as well. And they've actually had to, a lot of them recently have had to even put up their pharmacies and their businesses as collateral to get loans just to pay off these clawback fees to stay open and keep their, their doors open, particularly in rural and underserved areas, which is a big patient access concern. Um, spread pricing. What's spread pricing? So spread pricing is when you overcharge the payer and you underpay the pharmacy. This happens a lot and it creates the spread, right? Where's all the, all the profits coming from? You don't see independent pharmacists in the top Fortune 500, so it's not going to the pharmacy. Um, it's, some of it does go to reduce premiums overall, but it doesn't do anything to reduce out-of-pocket costs. So that's a major concern for those with chronic conditions and very expensive drug costs. So that's a big concern for our members. So based on this feedback, you can see on the next slide, oh, one more before I get to that, let's go real quick, Medicare Part D. So this is an example of kind of the scope of the problem. This is where the federal government kind of got wind to, to what's going on, obviously. We reported uh, CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, reported those DIR, those clawback fees, rose more than 107,000% from 2010 to 2020. That's not a typo. Um, that's accurate. So obviously that's a problem. Um, we also hear that a lot of these uh, price concessions are passed on. It's not what Medicare said. Medicare said that less than 1% of those are passed on to the plans that receive it. Uh, the Medicare Payment Advisory Commission actually reported that the PBMs, uh, the DIR payments for the PBMs actually increased to $12.6 billion in 2021, and that's a 33% increase from the $9.5 billion in 2020. So any government folks at CMS that look at this knew that there was a problem, and they've actually tried to address that through regulation as well, too, but that's also why Congress has gotten involved um, at this point as well. Next slide. So I want to point out, too, National Forum with the National Forum today. So National Forum... Um, did respond. You can see the members of their value and access collaboration um, expressing concerns 
um, that were issued from the Federal Trade Commission study that was mentioned on PBM business practices. And if you see there, obviously, they, may, they mentioned that if it was a fully transparent marketplace where you're actually focused on lowering the overall net pharmacy costs rather than you know, generating more revenue from multiple sources, that's a much more sustainable business model. Um, and that's why PBMs need transparency and they need study. And that's why the FTC study is going on. That's going on over a number of years. Uh, there's actually another study going on in Capitol Hill too, but I can mention that later. So next slide. So we did a PBM 101 on Capitol Hill because we went to Capitol Hill and we talked to folks, congressional staffers, um, eager to kind of help their patients get access to medications and access to the, their pharmacies. And we went into actually meet with the chair of the oversight committee and the ranking member of the oversight committee, asked them what they were looking at, what they wanted to see, what we could help them um, get access to and, and contact with the members and the pharmacists in their district or with their patients. And um, we made sure that in those conversations, we asked questions about terminology that's being used, et cetera. So for instance, uh, I know one of the staffers asked us, you know, what's the difference between a dispensing fee, which is the one to $3 a pharmacist typically gets at the pharmacy counter, should be much higher than that, by the way, if we're doing something like Paxlovid, where you're doing an adverse event check, which should be around $50. Um, but the one to $3 at the, the counter that you get. Um, and then in addition to that, they said, well, what's and, and the difference between a DIR fee, right, which I just went over, which is a clawback fee. So we knew that Capitol Hill staffers on this very confusing topic needed some education as well, too. Uh, so what we did was we hosted a PBM 101 on Capitol Hill, uh, bipartisan, hosted by 70 members. Uh, 70 members of congressional staff showed up there as well, too, brought in um, our speakers, Antonio Chacha and Greg Raybold, also PBM experts to give a background and a full scale of the bigger picture that's going on. We also had Ryan Offitro, who's one of our pharmacists from Washington State, trans uh, he testified at the actual first hearing on Capitol Hill before the Senate um, on how he had to close a number of his benefits in medically underserved areas uh, because of these PBM business practices, which really affects the equity issues uh, that are very important for this administration and this Congress. Next slide. So what legislation is out there? We've heard a lot about what's going on in Congress, a lot. Uh, and even since even since I put this slide together, I think a few days ago, um, you can see in the House, one's, what's moving? What, what's really moving? You can see our support letter. We do support, obviously, the first Senate bill, but I'll go to the House first, uh, the Drug Pricing, Transparency, and Medicaid Act. This prohibits that spread pricing pack practice um, in Medicaid managed care. Uh, it's by Buddy Carter, who's a pharmacist in Congress, one of the two pharmacists in Congress, and moves us to a market-based system. Um, I can get into that a little bit later, too, I as well. I was going to say, yeah, Michael, I know we're going to dive into some of the proposed legislation in a little bit. So okay. let's hold on to that for the question. Uh, did you have anything else before we we dive in? Sure. That next slide real quick. I'll just show you, you know, our our priorities from APHA. We want transparency, obviously, and accountability in the marketplace, sustainability to make sure that pharmacies um, can be reimbursed in a sustainable business model and accountability and oversight. But thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you to all of our panelists who were sharing their expertise with us today. Uh, we have a lot of questions to dive into that were even just brought up in the conversation between you all representing the different perspectives. So let's dive right in. I think Brock, you posed the best question, which is what is a PBM and what do they do? And so I'll turn to Jim first to answer that one. And Jim, I'm sorry, your answer can't be pharmacy benefit manager. You got to go a little bit deeper than that. Oh, and you've got to unmute. There we go. Um, yeah, I mean, it's obvious the business has changed and you're seeing a lot more uh, margin being generated by PBMs than was being I guess, developed early on. Uh, and it's because of all these revenue streams. And, and I think what, hap what has happened is that the sophistication of the PBM model has gotten to the point now where no one can get their arms around it. And it's, you know, it's a, uh, I think it came out last week, there was a, a hearing, uh, I believe in Congress that was attended by the chief financial officer from one of the big three uh, PBMs and uh, CVS, if I remember right. I think there's other ways, this is a quote, there's other ways in the economic model that we can adjust to if one of these things changes. So in other words, if they pass a law that starts to reduce PBM margins, they're going to go back and revisit their models and change it to something that's going to preserve their margin. 
The, he said, the other important part of this is if some of these things change, it could lead to higher costs for employers and health plans. So you can look at that as reality. You can look at it as a caution. You can look at it as a threat, some people would. Uh, but the bottom line is simply that. They want to preserve their margin and their bottom line. And the reason is they spent a lot of time developing it over the last few decades. And now that they've had a bead drawn on them, um, that's going to be a challenge. And, and again, not knowing what's behind the scenes, not knowing how all these things are measured, what percentage goes into what margin bucket, depending on who the client is, it's going to be a tough, tough thing to bring under control. And, and so I think all of us are saying, you know, this needs to happen. Um, and how are we going to get that done? Certainly, and that talks a little bit about their functions in terms of a business, but what are their functions and impacts on clinical care? And maybe Michael, as uh, representing the pharmacists here, you can talk about what that experience is like. Sure. You know, I mean, from the managed care perspective, you have folks on the therapeutics committee that determine, you know, kind of try to determine the best medications that are there and the therapeutic equivalent drugs that are there at the best cost, the best efficacy. Um, but at the community pharmacy level and at the independent pharmacy level, um, where you can't compete with this. And we heard before, you don't have to choose a contract. You kind of do because it, it's a take it or leave it contract and you lose access to all of the patients that are a lot of times in your network. So you really don't have a lot of choice um, as an independent or community pharmacist to sign on to that. So if you don't, the only other passion, there are some innovative models coming out, um, with cash pay pharmacies, et cetera. So we're not really with Mark Cuban, et cetera, where we've shown some significant cost savings, but they're not there yet. And they can't really compete yet on that playing field. But the impact is if you're, you know, a chronic disease patient in a rural area in Iowa, if you're in Alaska, you know, where the, the community pharmacist is the only healthcare provider you have, you know, for miles and miles. Um, if you take away that, that pharmacy because the business practices are unsustainable, um, then you don't have access to any healthcare. Um, and that's certainly not helpful for anyone. And Kristen, I, I see you coming off mute and I was going well, uh, to turn to you to talk a little bit about and maybe respond to the, the point about not about not being forced to choose a PBM and where PBMs function within the system. Yeah, so I, I think everybody who's listening, if you have health insurance, you you know that when you go and you get a generic prescription filled, your cost sharing is lower than if you get a brand drug filled. And you generally probably don't realize for a preferred brand how much cheaper you're paying than than the actual cost of the drug itself. The, the latest uh, for orphan drugs right now, the new launch price, the average new launch price is $300,000 a year. And so I, I, we keep circling back to what is it pharmacy benefit managers do? And Jim has a, a long, long experience in the industry. But I think we're missing the key point here, which is that somebody has to negotiate with these guys to get the cost down. And somebody has to look out for the patients in terms of presenting to those who are sponsoring your, your health plan a, a set of drug benefits that they'll be able to afford because this stuff is really, really expensive and somebody needs to stand in there for the patient to negotiate to make it more affordable. And on average, our companies save more than $1,000 per year per patient on prescription drugs. Now, with respect to pharmacies, I th think that it is not inappropriate to ask pharmacies to compete for business. And that is also what PBMs bring to the table. There are a lot of pharmacies in this country. Obviously, we all need them. We revere our pharmacists. We rely on our pharmacists. They were incredibly important during COVID. And I think what our companies would like to see is how can we help the pharmacists and what policies would help the pharmacists to be able to, to practice at the top of their license more so that they're rewarded for all of their knowledge and less for counting out pills. And, and that's really where we need to, to, to push pharmacy, I think. You know, Kristen, you bring up a really interesting point, which is that most patients don't understand the difference between the list price and what they're paying. And I'm wondering, Brock, if you could answer maybe a little bit about why that is so opaque. Why it's opaque or why people don't understand it, I think. I think yes, that's both. The why people don't understand it. I mean, prices are hidden. Prices are complicated. This is um, 
Uh, this is a, a mainstay in healthcare writ large, including but not limited to the pharmaceutical sector. We have more healthcare prices than we have people uh, in the country. Um, and, and that's a literal statement. It's because uh, we have, that's not just because we have a lot of products. It's because we have, for each individual product, we have different prices that are sold to different people, uh, depending on who they are, who represents them, and what the circumstance is. Now, that is one thing that, again, ostensibly, theoretically, PBMs have emerged to help solve or at least simplify. Um, they are capable of reducing the list price uh, that manufacturers try to charge uh, for many of their drugs. Um, but the truth is, there are a lot of there are a lot of people who are negotiating down by the list price, and I'm, I, I you know, when uh, when Kristen says that they save a thousand dollars per people uh, per member, um, the big question is a thousand dollars from what? Um, there are a lot of baselines that you can begin with, um, but that's not to say that uh, they cannot and do not serve significant roles. Um, yeah, you know, Kristen says someone has to speak for the patient. And that is simply because patients cannot navigate an industry as significant and as important and as complicated as this one. The big question is whether PBMs are the ones to do that or who or whether they do it at all. Um, my short answer is somewhere between Kristen's and Michael's. They do it a little bit. They don't do it nearly as much as we'd like them to. Uh, there are a lot of reasons why they don't do it as much as we, we think a competitive market would make them. Um, and there might be some reason for some regulatory intervention. Uh, but this is a very complicated marketplace where lots of people are trying to exploit the disinformation or lack of information that consumers have. That's insurers, that's doctors, that's manufacturers, that's PBMs, that's GPOs. Um, and one thing I will say, in you know, my last comment right now is that this, I find a little frustrating when we talk about health, the healthcare sector, is that often an industry in defending their own actions points to another player who they say are doing things that are much worse. Um, and of course, there's a little bit of truth to that. There are lots of players out there who are taking advantage uh, of consumer misinformation and lack of information. Um, but that doesn't, by definition, certainly justify the kind of conduct they're doing themselves. Well, sure, trust the economist to make us do some math and look at what prices really are. <laughs> Kristen, I wanna talk a little bit, Barack has talked about some of the regulation that could be used in the system. Can you tell us a little bit about what the regulations are currently on PBMs? And I know there's a ton of action at the state level, but there's also action at the federal level as well. So there, yeah. There, there is a significant amount of state regulation of PBMs that I am not going to run through because I don't know it as well as I know the federal level, but states are passing any number of laws regulating PBMs. Um, at the federal level, PBMs are subject to significant transparency requirements in Medicare Part D and to the, the secretary with respect to the exchanges. So there PBMs have to give to four federal agencies fairly significant reporting on uh, the, the cost of the top 50 drugs, um, the net of the top 50 drugs, um, and, and to the secretary reporting on spread and a variety of other things. So there's a significant amount of reporting at the federal level uh, that is not made public with respect to granular reports on per drug net costs. And the theory behind that is if you put out your best deal on a given thing, like if, if this could work in, for the hospitals and the docs as well, if you put out the best deal that you got, then what happens is the competitors, if, if somebody discounted more deeply than somebody else, they basically say, oh my, I was really dumb. And they, they, all the prices come up, all the net costs come up somewhat. So the reporting so far has been confidential to the secretary and the secretaries of um, HHS, labor, and the treasury are supposed to put out a report every other year on transparency on what's going on with respect to drug costs and drug trend and pharmacies and a whole variety of other things. 
There's also indirect reporting through the um, transparency and coverage um, reporting that PBMs are having to give health plans information. Um, and so there, there's a whole variety of reporting that's happening at the federal level. Um, PBMs, you know, through ERISA um, have to do as their clients require via contract, which is a little bit different than regulation, but is, is certainly part of the, the whole federal regulatory scheme, which allows for flexibility by employers to figure out what they want and need and to contract for it. Um, so hopefully that helps somewhat. Yeah, and I wanna, Jim, give you a chance to chime in here. So certainly you're hearing about all of the transparency that's currently required and you're hearing what is currently needed of PBMs. Do you think more is needed? And if so, what? Yeah, I mean, I again, I don't think people are able to get their arms around each of these elements. And, and I think the PBMs have done a lot to obfuscate, if you will, uh, where each of these elements are showing up in their financial models. Um, and I think that that's, again, one of the reasons why it's so hard for people to be able to consider transparency to be something that's in place. I mean, I hear transparency, uh, and I agree that transparency is important, but who's defining it? And, and if the PBMs are saying, hey, I'm transparent and here's how, uh, they still have the last, the last move here as far as uh, you know, how they're gonna report it or what bucket it's gonna go into. And I think that's the challenge again for everybody as far as getting to the bottom of this. PBMs do a lot of good things and formularies direct people to more cost-effective drugs. Uh, you know, there are clinical programs. Uh, you can spot uh, people who are non-adherent. You can find uh, people who have had drug-drug interactions, maybe avoid drug-drug interactions. I mean, those are all legitimate business elements. Uh, but when it comes to the financial part, leaving the PBMs in charge of defining transparency or indicating that they satisfy the requirements for transparency is a hard argument to make. Michael, what information would pharmacists want to know either from PBMs or within the system? You spoke a little bit about the need for transparency, but how would you define that? What would you all need to be empowered to help patients? Sure. Well, I mean, there's a number of bills and we haven't talked about on Capitol Hill to increase transparency, I think, for both employers as well as the public. I, I think, as Kristen mentioned, a lot of them go to CMS right now. We can't see that. Right. And all in the contracts is proprietary. Right. Um, lucky for us, we've got some smart folks out there who've started to look commercial data sets. Uh, NADAC, for instance, National Average Drug Acquisition Cost by Medicaid. So there's public data out there. And the news is when you start digging into the data, you find some really ridiculous examples, right? And we're all talking about fake prices, right? We're talking about list prices. We said that before, how much you save off a of price. That's not the real price, right? That's a sticker price. So I think information that you need to have, you know, specifically has to be, you know, delivery, you know, how it's going to be their dispensing fees, et cetera, et cetera, acquisition costs, all that. So a lot of this has been, you know, secret and behind the curtain. And the more we find out about it, the studies that have been done, I'll give you an example one was done recently in Oregon. Medicaid found that they overpaid $1.9 million on one single drug where it was marked up by 800% by the PBM. So when you get the data, you find these. And I think that's what Jim mentioned too as well. When you can you can dig into this stuff, um, you can find it and make it more transparent for folks. You know, and it's I wouldn't say it's a business case though. I would take take a disagreement with that. I think it's a patient care case and as healthcare providers, that's why it's so important for pharmacists to have this information um, so that we can we can identify those adverse events. We can identify all those drug drug interactions things that are you know more difficult and you'll often find when you go into a pharmacy we used to have these things called gag clauses that we got rid of federally a while ago as well too where you couldn't tell the cash price um at the counter um, where you'd be kicked out of the network so now that's been changed so you know i think the main goal for the pharmacist is to provide you the best drug at the best price right at the pharmacy counter but a lot of times you know we've changed some things to do that but more data is only going to help so i'd say I'd almost say any transparency is better than what we have now, um, but there is some. There is some out there um, for Medicaid I'd look at, and I'd also look at commercial data sets um, as well. 
Um, but we can certainly get a lot more. We'd love for Part D to open some of the books, but you're really going to only get that in aggregate information amounts because a lot of that is proprietary. Um, and that was required, as Kristen mentioned, under federal law since 2021. I've emailed about four times this week uh, Senate, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services Insurance Department, CCIIO, looking for that report. Uh, because we'd all love to see it, um, and any data is better than no data at all. But I think, you know, we're really looking for data to help the patient at the counter and to lower the price that they pay. Thanks. And Brock, Kristen in her presentation talked about how there are 76 uh, independent PBMs competing for business. Why do you think if there are 76 that so much of the market is focused within those big three? Well, it's because there are scale economies, and that's both a good thing and a bad thing. Um, so what is a scale economy? It basically means that uh, if a company gets bigger, they can do the same thing uh, at a lower cost to them. And ideally, uh, if they can do something at a lower cost, it means that the economy grows. It means that there is a greater degree of surplus. Um, a lot of that surplus tends to go to the entity that enjoys the scale economies, but a lot of the benefits also go to the consumers and net, net you know, and overall it's, it's a gain. So scale economies are not necessarily a bad thing. They're just something that you have to deal with. Um, what's particularly interesting and important about a, a scale economies in an intermediary is that they really, they, they derive their scale, they derive their comparative advantage by controlling information. You know, what a PBM does is it matches a manufacturer's drug with a patient. Um, and the more manufacturers you have in your network, the more valuable your, your, your formulary is, the more people you have signed up for your formulary, the better deals you can sign up with your manufacturers. It's a, it's a self-reinforcing economy of scale. But that also means um, that there are a number of structural uh, sources of harm to the marketplace. There's a lot of vertical integration. Um, there's a lot of captive supply. And... Uh, some people are squeezed out like the pharmacists. Um, now, I, I was picking on Kristen before, so I, I, I want to prove my bona fides as an even-handed uh, commentator here. One thing that Kristen said that is very important, and it's something that Michael's not going to like, um, is that one thing that PBMs have done, in particular with their integration with, um, with large retail chains, um, is they have made the cost of uh, dispensing cheaper. Um, and that means that pharmacists uh, get squeezed. Now they get squeezed, the way I'm describing it, they get squeezed because there is a less expensive option out there for doing a lot of the same things. This is capitalism. And to a large degree, I gotta say that it's the kind of innovation, cost reduction innovation that the American healthcare system large, usually does not embrace and needs to embrace a great deal more. We need to bring down prices for knee replacements. We need to bring down prices uh, for access to healthcare information. Um, there are all sorts of innovators out there who might be able to do it, and they have enormous difficulty getting into the marketplace. So a lot of this is good. Um, the other thing that Kristen said that's important, uh, and again, it relates to, to Michael's role in the world, is that... Um, much like we don't want surgeons doing primary care, we don't want pharmacists to basically fill up 10 pills in a bottle and send it out. Um, that's not, in Karen's language, not operating at the top of their license. That's not really where their value added is. Now, to a large degree, historically, that is those are the services, those are the sources of revenue that pharmacists have relied on. So I'm really sympathetic with pharmacists that a main source of revenue is being taken away by a lower cost provider. Um, and I'm also very sympathetic um, that Michael, the people that Michael represent offer enormous value to their communities. Um, what we need to do as we confront the damages that PBMs are doing, we also need to embrace the benefits they're doing. And that might mean we have to really rethink uh, our entire uh, workforce personnel, healthcare personnel. Um, like nurses, like doctors, pharmacists can do an, a lot of good, but they are doing their greatest good if they're doing what they're really trained to do and not something 
that somebody who's less skilled can do instead? So we have four minutes left and four panelists. So I'm going to give you each a minute to solve the problem that we're facing today, which is what should be done to move forward with PBMs. And I'll start with you, Michael. Well, I'll embrace practicing at the top of our license. I'll certainly embrace that. Pharmacists are not pill dispensers. They're healthcare providers and practitioners that provide a number of services. We now have another webinar on that, so I won't take up that, that much time. I mean, I mean, it's coming, though. Reform's coming. If you don't think it's coming, you should let this week. The Senate Finance Committee introduced bipartisan legislation. It's the powerful committee that has oversight over Medicare and Medicaid, the largest payers in the country. So it, it's coming. So I think we're going to see a lot of reforms. I think delinking, obviously, the profit sharing um, ability of the, the PBM, delinking that from the price, it's a good start, right? So I think that that's where we're going to probably see some momentum and movement. But stay tuned because get your popcorn. Um, it's going to be an interesting few months in Congress. It is. Jim, wave your magic wand. What would you do to reform PBMs moving forward? And what should the uh, people listening on this call advocate for? Well, I think the, you know, what we've seen is that PBMs have learned how to operate within this business model in such a way that profits have continued to grow, margins have continued to grow. And, uh, and, and then the you know, Brock talked a little bit about the FTC. I think they sort of lost control of this segment of the market. Uh, I mean, you've got three big players here whose business models really don't differ that much. Uh, and they're going out every three years to, you know, try and attract business, but not that much is moving. Uh, and there's no pressure on anybody to uh, have to really adapt uh to a new business model. So I, I, I think that is coming. Reform is coming and it's going to change things pretty dramatically. I just don't know how long it's going to take to get done because we've been talking about this for a long time. Barack, what reforms would you suggest? I, I think that the, the particular reforms regarding PBMs we need to focus on involves one of the parties that's not on this webinar, that is the pharmaceutical manufacturers, the ones that own the patents. Um, they are significantly responsible for, um, for increases in drug costs and also the prolongation of patent life. Basically, the, um, they, ha they have engaged in a whole bunch of maneuvers to keep out generic competition. PBMs can really help uh, facilitate generic entry. I'm not sure they do. It's the relationships between the manufacturers and PBMs, the contracts they have, uh, the role that rebates play that I think really needs to have a lot of scrutiny, um, certainly by the FTC, maybe from Congress and the GAO as well. And Kristen, we'll give you the final word. What did the attendees need to know about PBMs moving forward? So I'd say one thing, PBMs absolutely have encouraged generics. 90% of prescriptions are filled with generics, and that's because of the work that PBMs have done. But what I was going to do was agree with Barack on the idea that we really need Congress to look at the patent thickets and the patent abuses and get more competition into the market. That would help a lot. And then another thing that would help a lot is as the biosimilars come into the market, we need the FDA to, to figure out how to make it clear to everybody that even if they're not in the interchangeable pathway, they didn't come through as, as interchangeable, they are interchangeable. If it's biosimilar, it's biosimilar. And we need to encourage physicians to use them and to prescribe them. And then finally, with respect to transparency, PBMs are providing real-time benefits tools that physicians can look at when they're prescribing. And we think that would reduce a whole lot of abrasion in the system and really get at what we're all looking for here. The, the issue isn't what the problem is with PBMs. The issue is why are prescription drugs so expensive and what can we all do to make them cost less for patients and for, and for plan sponsors? And those things would help. Well, it sounds like between biosimilars and patents, we've lined up the next topics for the Value and Innovation Forum to dive into. We could spend many hours on that. I want to say thank you to all of today's panelists for providing different perspectives and for playing nicely with each other. The Value and Innovation Forum is grateful for all of you for sharing your time and expertise, and hopefully our efforts continue beyond this discussion and we can keep putting positive changes into practice. 
We hope that you take what you've learned today and put it into use in your advocacy with Congress and other regulatory and legislative bodies. Please make sure to fill out the survey that was placed in the chat and have a great day.